tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Is it a white SUV? White SUV, yeah. yeah. Deadly gunfire. It was really scary. We all ducked and like I didn't know what to do. I literally thought like I, I was going to get shot. Another gangster gunned down in a shopping mall parking lot also. So right now our search and rescue teams from all over Vancouver Island are assisting with the search. Where is Seneca Gay Elliott? The search for a missing UBC professor on Salt Spring Island and. One of our missions is to connect people to nature. Strolling to the sky, the island tourist attraction taking visitors to new heights. This is CBC Vancouver News. Cries for help as a man lays dying in a car. Another man and woman seriously wounded rush to hospital. Diners on a busy restaurant patio scramble as the gunfire erupts. A car left riddled with bullets. And another young man killed in an escalating wave of gang violence. Good evening and thanks for joining us. After this latest shooting in a busy public place in Burnaby, police are putting gangs on notice. As Greg Rasmussen reports, they're talking tough and promising to crack down. Is it a white SUV? White SUV, yeah. yeah. The immediate aftermath of this latest deadly shooting in an area crowded with people. There was a lot of pop, 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 and then we heard sirens and sirens. It sounded like it was a gunfight, not just a shooting, but a gunfight. People were flipping their tables to protect themselves from the gunshots. This server at a nearby restaurant says people were sent scrambling. It was really scary. We all ducked and like I didn't know what to do. I literally thought like I, I was going to get shot. Yeah. First responders could be seen trying to save the victim found in his car. The woman who shot this video was afraid to be identified because she was only about 15 meters away when the shooting started. Every day there seems to be a shooting and people should be able to go and go about their business and you know not be caught in the crossfires of these shots. The latest victim, 23-year-old Jazz Kirt Kalkat, was known to police and had ties to gangs. A woman and a second man were also shot but are expected to survive. This is not a war. These are reckless young men who happen to have access to very dangerous weapons. Since mid-April, seven men have been shot to death in the Vancouver area, most in busy public locations, including Vancouver International Airport, a park outside a recreation centre, and near stores and restaurants. We are losing a lot of South Asian young men to this violence. Many of the victims have ties to South Asian gangs, a concern for those working to head off further violence. Definitely, there is a worry about stigma um, in the community that all, like, all youth are going to start getting labeled as zero in a gang. From the police, a fresh warning. For those who are involved in this, we are coming after you. In this latest case, so far, no arrests. Only a burnt-out vehicle found later that night. Police suggest it was used in the getaway. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. More than 50% of eligible British Columbians have now been vaccinated, and the province is dropping the booking age rapidly, 18-plus by the end of this weekend. But as Joel Ballard reports, some people say they simply aren't getting contacted at all to book. BC's vaccination rollout is well underway. For many, a sense of excitement to finally be eligible. There's like a group message with a bunch of me and my girlfriends, and a bunch of them were starting to say like, oh, I'm getting... The, the email or I'm getting the text, um, have you gotten yours yet? She hadn't, so she called the helpline and was told to be patient. When she called back... She asked for my health care number again and she checked the system and said, oh, there was some kind of glitch. The system failed to recognize her care card number. Once the agent fixed it, she received her notification within an hour. And there have been other small issues. On Twitter, some people say they ran into trouble when it came to their names. For example, the registration name was written as Ron, but the BC Services card says Ronald. Because of that difference, they say they didn't receive the link to sign up for an appointment. For some, the vaccination process has been smooth sailing. In my case, I was notified, booked, and vaccinated all within 48 hours. 
But again, there have been small technical issues. In some cases, the problems appeared while trying to book the appointment. So I just followed the link and went onto the website um, and selected my community, which is New Westminster, but it's fairly small, so there were no available appointments. Taylor says the booking calendar was blank, no explanation of why it was empty or what to do next. They too called the hotline and were told to wait, but they noticed online that people were booking vaccines in nearby cities. I didn't want to cheat, so, so I called them back and asked if that was, uh, if I should just wait or if that would be appropriate. The agent gave the go ahead, so they booked an appointment in Surrey. While Gallagher is thrilled to be getting the vaccine, she worries that people might be falling through the cracks. I thought to myself, how many people that are eligible for the vaccine are not getting the notification, but they're unaware that there's this glitch in the system? CBC News has reached out to the province for clarity, but no one has responded. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. BC continues to report encouraging COVID-19 numbers. The province is recording 494 cases today, going under 500 for the first time in nearly two months. But sadly, two more people have lost their lives. Active cases are just above 5,500, the lowest since March 23rd. The number of people in hospital has dropped to under 400, which is the lowest since mid-April. 141 are in critical care. Almost 58,000 people were vaccinated in B.C. yesterday. That's the third highest number so far. Search and rescue teams are scouring a Gulf Island tonight for a missing UBC professor. She's been missing for two days. Stan Bird is live. Dan, who is the missing woman? Her name is Seneca Gay Elliott. She's been an associate professor with the sociology department at UBC since 2007. Friends and family are very worried about her right now. RCMP on Salt Spring Island say Elliot left her home to run some errands on Wednesday. She hasn't been seen or heard from since. Foul play is not suspected in her disappearance. Mounties and search crews found her vehicle abandoned on Juniper Place Road Wednesday night. They're focusing their search in and around Mount Erskine. That's not far from where they found her vehicle. They say they appreciate people's willingness to help them search. However... We're actually asking those who want to assist to actually search in other areas just to keep that area clear for the professional search and rescue teams that are uh, making their way there. Uh, that Mount Erskine area is fairly treacherous and we don't want to have uh, more than, we don't want to have any more, uh, any, uh, any more searches that are necessary out in that area. Seneca Gay Elliott is said to be about five feet, three inches tall, with yes, short, uh, right dark brown hair that, and a slim person. build. She was last seen wearing a red sweater, jeans and brown boots. Colleagues at UBC are very concerned for Elliott. They call her a dedicated mentor to her students. If you've seen Seneca Gay Elliott or know where she is, you're asked to contact Salt Spring Island RCMP. Mike, Anita. Dan Burt, live for us tonight. Thank you, Dan. Police are investigating acts of mischief and vandalism to the exterior of the Chinese consulate in Vancouver. These acts are disrespectful and intolerable, and it's something that, as a police force, we don't tolerate, and we will be actively and are continue to actively investigate these. On March 22nd, a man spat at and hammered on a plaque dedicated to the Chinese consular general. He then spat on an employee vehicle while verbally berating the driver. Then on April 4th at around 3 a.m., another man spray-painted graffiti on the gate and wall. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. We're here to show support to the family, the victims, who've gone through this, this unbelievable uh, uh, incident. I'm a mother and I could not imagine this could have happened to me. If Stand with Asians Coalition organized a rally today to denounce a recent racially motivated hate crime at a Burger King in Richmond. On May 1st, a man approached a family sitting in their SUV at the drive through and started yelling at them. The suspect then threatened to kill someone. Police are investigating it as a hate incident. A couple in Maple Ridge is struggling to reunite with their teenage son in India. As Marie Seidler reports, they applied for his permanent residency more than two years ago, but have been left without answers. I get overwhelmed. It's not, not even a single day goes by when I don't cry because, I mean, I'm losing hope.
It's been more than two years since Nupur Soin last saw her son Shorya. She moved to Maple Ridge from India shortly after she married Ajay Soin in 2018. The newlyweds expected the boy would be able to join them in Canada in about a year. When we got married, I thought we were going to have a, have a nice little family and a great place to live in because I was already here. Last year, they welcomed a daughter into the world. Even though she's 16 months old, she has yet to meet her big brother. Shorya is 15. He's Nippur's son from a previous marriage. In 2007, she got divorced, and she has not been in touch with her ex since then. Nippur is her son's sole custodian. Currently, Shorya is living with his grandmother in New Delhi, a city recently ravaged by COVID-19. With each passing week, Nupur worries that she might never see her son again. Honestly, I'm not able to sleep and I recently uh, took appointment from my doctor and she gave me some anti-anxiety pills and I have to take that. That's the only way I can sleep at night because things are so scary. The Soins have no idea why Shoria's permanent residency application has been delayed. They applied more than a year before the start of the pandemic. Their lawyer says all their paperwork is in order. This is a case where they should issue the visa and allow the child to come as soon as possible. Immigration lawyer Alex Stoichevich has been working with the Soins. He says this is a straightforward case that should have been resolved ages ago. Really what needs to happen is somebody needs to make this a priority. Immigration Canada did not respond to requests for comment. The Soins say they can't help but wonder if something else is going on. This community, Maple Ridge, has really accepted us. We really like it here. But I, sometimes I wonder if Canada has really accepted us as a, as a family. Marie Seidler, CBC News, Maple Ridge. A former high-profile B.C. minister was back on the stand today at the public inquiry into money laundering. Rich Coleman was recalled after inconsistent testimony he gave last month. What he said in the inquiry was different than what he told the CBC on the same topic back in 2011. Valpiri of our Impact Team reports. Just over a decade ago, when CBC exposed a series of suspicious transactions at BC casinos, the man in charge of the RCMP's Proceeds of Crime Unit didn't mince his words. We're suspicious that it's dirty money, and, and anybody, uh, the common person would say, this stinks. There's no doubt about it. The man in charge of gaming in the province at the time responded with this. Let's deal with Mr. Baxter because he's offside with some of the messaging I got from the RCMP last week when I asked them the question. I don't agree with him and neither do all the superiors of his in the RCMP. And that's why I said to them, okay, guys, we're going to have a look at this. Uh, these comments came from you. I want them backed up. Last month, when Rich Coleman testified at the public inquiry into money laundering, he had this exchange with inquiry lawyer Brock Martland. Did you um, do anything in response to comments by the comments that were made by Inspector Baxter? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. Coleman was called back to clarify his testimony and his comments to CBC. And I'm not going to go throw aspersions on somebody in the media that's made their comments uh, personally. I, I, I might have misheard your answer just there. Did you say that you wouldn't have said you would disagree with his comments? I did, I did disagree with them in the context they were given, but what I'm yeah. saying is I didn't personally say I don't think any negative about, personally about Mr. Baxter. The former Solicitor General says he didn't speak directly to the RCMP about Baxter's comments. Sometimes in a, in a live radio interview you tend to use a word versus another when you're trying to do it as a minister on behalf of your, your entire group of people. Uh, I should have used the word we versus I. Coleman testified, maybe I went too far because he says he was caught off guard by Baxter's public assessment of the situation in BC casinos. The inquiry will resume for final submissions in July. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. A U.S. bill allowing cruise ships to bypass Canadian ports is on course to become law. The U.S. Senate approved the bill yesterday, but the temporary changes will automatically change back when Canadian ports are reopened to cruise ships. Cruise ships have been banned from entering our harbour since last spring. The ban is set to stick until early 2022. Johanna Wagstaff here now with our first check of the forecast. Made mm -hmm. a, made, well, I made a lot of mistakes today, but uh, perhaps the biggest one, Joe, was uh, wearing a a sweatshirt for whatever reason out on my walk this morning. Sweatshirt. Ooh. 
Yeah. Yes, I thought you were going to say your big mistake was wearing shorts, and then I would say, <laughs> but was it a big mistake? It was sort of a shorts day, but you're right, sweater, big mistake, big Terrible. mistake. So let this be a warning for everyone this weekend. It's not really sweatshirt weather. I mean, by the water, there is a, a bit of a breeze. We've got a northwesterly flow right now, but temperatures are uh, quite mild and getting a touch warmer as we head into the weekend. Uh, let me take you through the current temperatures right now. 17 at YVR, 20s though inland, and again, we'll uh, gain another degree or two over Saturday with the peak of the heat on Sunday, but we're seeing that high pressure ridge steady across most of Southern BC. Here's a snapshot of your highs tomorrow. Many stations I think will hit the 23 degree mark and you can see those light greens on the temperature contour map. Uh, just really near the water is where we'll be uh, hovering around 18, 19 for tomorrow. So that's all thanks to this high pressure ridge. I should mention little bit of a trough, sort of an area of low sneaking through Kamloops uh, and up towards the central interior right now. So a few showers tonight that should clear out for tomorrow. But we'll talk more about uh, the fire danger because this is playing a role in uh, building fire danger and all of the moisture right now up towards central and northern coastal sections. But uh, I do have some rain in the forecast. I'll take you through a uh, hot, dare I say, hot weekend and into the rain coming up. Oh, OK. Well, uh, talk to you <laughs> soon, Joe. Thank you. Okay, it towers over the Malahat Highway on Vancouver Island, and soon you'll actually be able to go up the Malahat Skywalk. But as video producer Mike MacArthur shows us tonight, the twist is about how you get down. Oh, it was the wrong item. Anyway, our apologies, but we will uh, sort that out and, so, and get it to you later because you have to see this uh, skywalk. Yeah, now I can't ask you if you're actually going to go up it or not, Mr. Uh, my my tees will be, yeah, my tees will be, I might, I actually <laughs> might try this one. Anyway, uh, just a quick reminder, if you aren't uh, already doing so, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. You can also watch it on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, we are on Instagram. Oh, we're just getting word that we've actually solved our technical difficulties, so we're going to show you the Malahat Skywalk now. Take a look. I'm Ken Bailey from the Malahat Skywalk, general manager. Malahat Skywalk experience is made up of three components. We've got our welcome center, which you can see behind me. We've got a 600 meter elevated walkway that carries guests through the canopy of the trees, anywhere from 30 to 70 feet off the forest floor. And then the third piece is the spiral tower. So once you get to the end of this 600 meter walkway, you transition onto our spiral tower, which is uh, 40 meters up. You ascend, it's about 500 meters long and you ascend to the top. Um, at the top, there's a 360 degree viewing platform. Uh, interpretive panels that teach people about the, the surrounding areas, the marine life, uh, some of the Malahat First Nation history, geography of the area, because of course when you're at the top, you can see into two countries. You can see uh, Mount Baker like it's right beside you. You can see the Gulf Islands on a clear day like today. You can see as far over as the North Shore Mountains. Our goal was to build something that was going to help the community and grow tourism in the community for a long time. I understand you have a unique way to get down. Yeah, once you're at the top, uh, you can come down the, the same spiral ramp you came down, but we decided to add a little bit of, a little bit of excitement and you can take the 20 meter spiral slide down uh, that gets you right back down to the bottom where you started. I was not expecting a slide. That's pretty awesome. I, it looks wonderful. I think it, 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 I'll put it on my list post pandemic. I think they're planning to open in July, so. We'll, we'll see, see if you we'll actually see. do it. Nice work by a, a video producer, Mike MacArthur on the, uh, the Skywalk tonight. Well, the conflict in the Middle East appears to be intensifying tonight. Just ahead, how the violence is now spreading outside Gaza to the West Bank. Thank you for joining us on our commercial free live stream. Well, an Ontario artist is helping other artists struggling with addiction and mental health by offering free space for them to create and exhibit their work. As Robin Miller explains, part of the plan includes a program aimed at helping the communities most vulnerable. Patrick John Mills knows how vital art is to his own mental health. 
This series, titled Malignant, was born after a recent cancer diagnosis. It was a way to feel in control and process his own mortality. Now Mills wants to help others through a new program called The Art of Recovery. I have enough. I have enough, and what I don't have enough of is people being happy and kind to one another. Mills plans to offer free lessons for those struggling with mental health and addiction, a space for people to support each other and get creative. He already has various artists lined up to teach, including John Robert Bradley, who is a recovering addict himself. And art's a great thing. Um, it, uh, it allows us to sort of escape for a while, focus on something positive, be creative, and produce something uh, that they can be proud of. You know, I like that idea. Yeah. William March knows that firsthand. He spent years of his life addicted to drugs, but rediscovered art while in a rehabilitation facility. He can't wait for the program to get started. Without art, I don't think I could have got through this past year. It's just, you know, there's so much isolation, and isolation is, like, terrible for addicts. I mean, it's terrible for anybody, but especially for addicts. March says Renfrew has a robust recovery community and a program like this is needed. Artists of all skill levels are welcome. So many people tell me they're not an artist or they can't, but in my experience, absolutely everybody has something that's creative that they can delve into. Mills says he plans to start running the program as soon as restrictions allow. He says people are desperate to connect and he's got the space, the canvases and the paint to do it. Robin Miller, CBC News, Renfrew. Great stuff. For more on Patrick John Mills and the Art of Recovery program, you can head to cbc.ca. And coming up next, we have uh, reporters on the ground in the Middle East and in India. We'll have the very latest from there next. In the Middle East, violence between Israel and Gaza is spreading to the West Bank. Clashes in several towns between Palestinian and Israeli forces. Our Margaret Evans is in Jerusalem tonight and brings us more on the calls for a ceasefire. The shadow of this conflict clings to the skies above Gaza with increasing intensity. The emerging pattern already familiar. By day, there is grief. Here, mourning for a dead child, one of the latest victims of Israeli airstrikes in Gaza. What has this baby done, asks the child's father. We were sitting safely at home. We didn't hear a warning rocket. Israelis have also lost children. Hamas, the militant group in control of Gaza, has fired an estimated 2,000 rockets at Israel over the past week, some hitting their mark with devastating effect. But it is the speed with which the conflict is moving beyond the Hamas versus Israel narrative alone that is less familiar here, especially the ugly scenes of crowds of Jewish and Arab Israelis attacking each other. The occupied West Bank is now roiling too. At least 10 Palestinians left dead, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, after post-Friday prayer demonstrations and confrontations with Israeli soldiers. Calls for a ceasefire are piling up. The fighting has the potential to unleash an uncontainable security and humanitarian crisis and to further foster extremism, not only in the occupied Palestinian territory in Israel, but in the region as a whole. 
Next door in Jordan, police clashed with demonstrators trying to reach the West Bank, and pro-Palestinian marchers in Lebanon did manage to cross the border, albeit briefly. Israeli leaders have said they want to go a good deal further in destroying the Hamas infrastructure in Gaza before they will agree to a ceasefire. Last night, Israeli airstrikes targeted a network of tunnels stretching beneath Gaza, said to be used by Hamas for smuggling. False reports of an Israeli ground offensive reportedly sending senior Hamas commanders underground. Today, Palestinian families living along Gaza's northern border with Israel began moving away from it, seeking shelter at UN schools. Fearful a ground invasion may still be coming. Margaret Evans reporting from Jerusalem tonight. To breaking news now, and the officer in charge of Canada's vaccine rollout has suddenly stepped down and is now the subject of a military investigation. Major General Danny Fortin was got, he got the job last uh, November, sorry, in a brief statement. The Department of National Defense did not describe any allegations against Fortin. It didn't explain the nature of the investigation, only saying it is reviewing its next steps. More than 4,000 people have died of COVID-19 in India for the third straight day. And as freelance reporter Neha Punia reports tonight, low supply of vaccines continues to dog India's push to inoculate its vast population. This is now a common sight in a country that's known as the world's largest manufacturer of vaccines. India's mass immunization drive is faltering because of a severe shortage of vaccines. Several states have shut down centers. Some regions say they cannot expand the drive. Just a month ago, more than 3 million shots were being administered every day. But now the country is averaging about half of that. So far, only 3% of the population in India has been fully vaccinated. The deadly second wave continues to wreak havoc on India's overstretched healthcare services. The acute shortage of beds, medical oxygen and even doctors is no longer limited to cities like Delhi. The pandemic is ravaging smaller towns and villages, areas that never had adequate health care facilities to begin with. Initially, we never used, we had a bad experience last year also, but the younger population was not getting involved. Now, this time, everyone is getting involved. We are having high morbidity. International aid from more than 30 countries, including Canada, continues to pour in as allies send oxygen concentrators and essential drugs, but it's vaccines that India desperately needs. White House coronavirus advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci has this advice for the Modi government. We all know India is one of the best, if not the biggest, uh, vaccine producer in the world. So you've got to use some of those resources for your own people. After repeatedly denying there's an acute shortage of vaccines, the Indian government now says it is in touch with Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. Today, India administered its first shot of Sputnik V, having imported thousands of doses of the Russian vaccine earlier this month. Opposition parties say this is too little, too late, questioning why India exported millions of doses to more than 90 countries earlier this year. They allege the Modi government prioritized diplomacy efforts over saving thousands of lives at home. Neha Punia for CBC News, Delhi. Well, some hope from Canadian health officials tonight who say the country has passed the peak of the COVID-19 third wave. And as Christine Birak reports, there could be more positive developments possible for summer and fall. If you've got one shot of COVID vaccine, health officials say you'll likely be spending time with family and friends outdoors this summer. And if all goes well, come the fall, people could be mixing indoors too. On a national level, we're seeing hopeful signs that we've passed the peak of the third wave. And with that, health officials released a highly anticipated roadmap to recovery, stressing Canadians need to stay apart for the rest of this spring. Cases are high and vaccine coverage is low, so people should get vaccinated. 
Come summer, if roughly 75% of Canadians have one dose and 20% have a second dose, then restrictions may start to lift in your area, allowing for camping, hiking, picnics and patios. By fall, if 75% of those eligible for vaccines have received two shots, more restrictions will lift and you will be able to do more activities indoors with people outside your household. All this is possible so long as cases remain low. If cases go up again, all these metrics are sort of out the window. With the United States and the UK dramatically lowering restrictions, experts say Canada's plan is more cautious. We're on the ramp to normal. We really are on the ramp to normal. Um, it's going to be faster than many people predicted, but maybe not fast enough for many. Another bit of good news today, Public Health England put out a press release saying delaying second doses of the Pfizer vaccine works. Actually, the three months boost provided a stronger antibody response by quite a lot. The details haven't been released yet, but researchers say people over 80 who waited 11 to 12 weeks for their second shot had higher peak antibody levels than those who waited only three weeks. It's immensely reassuring and actually I think really adds to, you know, adds to our comfort um, with the current plan. It's been such a long road and the path ahead is still tricky, but vaccine supplies are ramping up weekly by the millions and many see those shots as our ticket out of this pandemic. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. The expulsion of two Alberta MLAs from the UCP caucus last night is having a ripple effect across the Prairie province. Most members of the caucus were silent today. But as Michelle Belafontaine reports, a fledgling political party is now welcoming the pair with open arms. Put uh, fuel in our tank and wind in our sail. I'd like Paul Hinman is having a good day. He says the expulsion of two members from the UCP caucus may trigger defections by the others. He says his party will greet what he calls these freedom fighters with open arms. The question is, is whether they're intimidated now and oh my goodness, we can't speak out and we just got to listen to the premier and go with his one thought, one idea, or whether there's going to carry on some conversation. Yesterday, Premier Jason Kenney met with his caucus for seven hours behind closed doors. After a vote, Cypress Medicine Hat MLA Drew Barnes and Central Peace Notley MLA Todd Lowen were out. Their crime? Speaking out against the UCP leadership and allegedly dividing the party. Lowen called for Jason Kenney's resignation in a letter published early Thursday morning. He has no regrets representing the view of his constituents. When I'm done as a politician, I want to be able to walk down the street in my hometown. I find I'll live there the rest of my life and, and I have to look these people in the eye and and I have to be able to know that, uh, that when they look back at me, they, they know that I've done my best to represent them. Lowen plans to sit in the legislature as an independent MLA, so he won't move to Hinman's party. Drew Barnes also plans to sit as an independent, but he isn't ruling out questions about a run for the leadership of the Wild Rose Independence Party. But again, I, I, I do need some time to talk, talk to my wife and my family. I do need some time to talk to my constituents. Uh, so I'm making no, no firm decisions. The problem for Barnes is that the deadline to enter the Wild Rose Independence Party leadership race was at 5 p.m. today. Hinman is filing his nomination papers. There is no word if the party plans to extend the deadline to let others enter the race. Michelle Belfontaine, CBC News, Edmonton. It's a crucial element of the tide water, but pollution has had a big impact on eelgrass. How students of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation School are helping bring it back next. Canadian Pacific is just as proud of this new line as it was of that primitive original route built more than a hundred years ago through the steep, narrow and beautiful Rogers Pass. The major difference though is that this line reduces the grade by almost half. It means fewer engines can pull more cars up the slope and across the continental divide. From the engineer in the cab to the company executives in the coach cars, CP says this project was necessary if it was to remain competitive. CP Rail boasts about what it had to do here, how it took five years to construct a two-kilometer bridgeway along one of the steep slopes, and how it reduced the grade by boring a 15-kilometer tunnel through Mount McDonald. 
It says one of the last bottlenecks on the line is gone. From now on, the heavy westbound freight will have a clear one-way track. The old line will carry the lighter eastbound freight. And CP celebrated part two of its national dream today by rolling a special train onto the Cupolo Creek siding between Golden and Revelstoke. Rogers Pass is the biggest project the railway has built since the completion of the original line 104 years ago. To help celebrate, CP brought in its senior company people and about 1,500 workers and their families, including many retired rail workers. This is long overdue, this uh, grade reduction. But what's interesting is the line is being opened at a time when the government is cutting its funding to be a rail, raising questions about the future of passenger service in Canada. But if passenger train service in Canada is in question, CP's message today with its new line is that freight traffic to the West Coast and Pacific Ocean has never looked better. Whit Fraser, CBC News in the Rogers Pass. And face the camera, please. There's something different going on at SFU's East Gym. Sure, like usual, it's full of young athletic types, but these athletes are not in the running for a team. They're in the running for fame and fortune. Rolling. Lisa Castor. Huh? Nike, 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 Nike. We're doing a print ad audition for Nike, and we're looking for uh, fit young people uh, between the ages of 18 and 24 with kind of a hip contemporary edge. Today's casting call attracted about 100 hopefuls, some more hopeful than others. Uh, chicks dig me, so that's... <laughs> uh, I don't know how hip I am, but... I really don't know what they're looking for. If you have lots of energy, you kind of tend to be a funky person, and uh, I think I've got that. Six to eight successful candidates will be chosen to appear in the ad. The reward? A two-day all-expenses-paid shoot in Whistler. And, of course, some money. Now, it won't be the millions Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods earn from their affiliation with the swoosh. In fact, no one seemed to know what the job would pay. Hey, they could pay me 50 bucks because I do it for free anyways. Uh, I don't know, 1,500? Maybe residuals? Probably a few hundred bucks, pretty sure. I'd almost pay them. Yeah. I'd probably be in it for some shoes or something. <laughs> Ballpark, could you give us an idea? Probably $500 a day, somewhere in that area. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Yeah, so people were flipping their tables to protect themselves from the gunshots. Another deadly shooting linked to Metro Vancouver's escalating gang conflict. 23-year-old gangster Jaskier Kalkat was killed in a Burnaby shopping mall parking lot. Two others were injured. This is the third fatal shooting in a week. So right now our search and rescue teams from all over Vancouver Island are assisting with the search. Um, uh, and we are using uh, police dog services and the RCMP air services. The search continues for a missing UBC professor on Salt Spring Island. Seneca Gay Elliott left home to run errands on Wednesday, and she hasn't been seen or heard from since. Well, students of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation School were getting their hands dirty this week. They're planting eelgrass at Kate's Park on the shores of Burrard Inlet, all part of an effort to restore the endangered marine plant and help the students connect with cultural practices. Angela George oversees the Tsleil-Waututh Nation School, and she joins us tonight with more on this. Uh, hi, Angela. First, can you tell us why this initiative is important uh, from an environmental perspective? Yes, yeah, certainly. Happy to be here. And the eelgrass is important to the ecosystem. And uh, the, the eelgra eelgrass restoration project is uh, very important to the health of the inlet and to, and to the health of the students who, who are able to get their hands in there, uh, being involved with this amazing project. Okay, and just uh, for all of our benefit, what, what is, what is eelgrass? Well, I'm sure the technical um, <laughs> people could uh, delve into that a lot more than I can. But um, it's a very significant component of our um, ecosystem in the Burrard Inlet. And, uh, you know, the restoring this is restoring the, the natural habitat and all of the life in the inlet that feeds off of the eelgrass, that lives in the eelgrass. Um, it will serve many purposes. And uh, from a cultural perspective, uh, what does this effort bring for the students? 
it's really important for students to know who they are and where they come from. So getting their hands in involved in this project um, and working to restore the inlet reconnects them to just that, who they are and where they come from. It helps to restore the, the balance and harmony within the ecosystem, but also within themselves and within our community. So their leadership and their involvement in this project is, is uh, exactly what our community school is all about. And, and, and how is this kind of learning uh, beneficial compared to, you know, the traditional in-class work? Well, it's, you know, studies show that it's, it's important for children to be happy and healthy, engaged and empowered to learn in the way that they learn in the way that they learn naturally. So it's, it's a, a priority for us to, to improve and to build upon and to continue to develop this land-based learning methodology. Our ancestors had ways of learning and ways of, of um, you know, very comprehensive social systems and structures in place. And we're repatriating that, we're restoring our connection to that and our understanding of our land and environment is a very key component in that. And just uh, quickly, uh, you're doing this during the pandemic, of course. Uh, are the students enjoying it? Oh yes, they're so happy. Uh, the feedback has been incredible. Our children are engaged, they're happy, they're empowered, and they're feeling a part of, and it's, it's, uh, it's been a really amazing uh, thing to witness them all come out of their shells and and to come together as a unit and that we're seeing so much leadership and the feedback from parents is that you know our attendance has improved immensely and children want to be at school they're happy and they don't want to be away from school so it's important for the students to be able to come together and to to really be out on the land is is just an added bonus all right, we'll leave it at that. Uh, Angela, best of luck to you and to the students, and uh, we appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you. Hiking trails closed, a widespread fire ban, a serious lack of rain on the prairies has some areas parched. The concern for farmers coming up. 641 Friday night, a live look uh, across the water to the North Shore tonight. It uh, strongly resembles a summer evening out there this evening, and the weekend is looking awesome. How warm will it get? We're gonna find out from Johanna next.
When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Prairie farmers are facing a tough growing season as it's abnormally dry there right now. But parts of Saskatchewan and Manitoba are dealing with moderate to extreme drought conditions. As Cameron McIntosh tells us, that could jeopardize crops, threaten water supply and increase the fire risk. It's just bone dry. Looking out on his fields, all Chuck Fossey can really do is wait and hope that something is going to grow out in that dust and dirt. There's nothing there to support the seed and the crop to grow. You see it's about an inch and a half of dry dirt before you start finding any moisture. He's seen drought before, but never a May like this. Still, he's trying, seeding deeper than normal, hoping to find some moisture. If we don't get a rain probably in the next two weeks, a nice general soaking rain, uh, we're probably talking of crop failure out here in uh, Manitoba. Just one third of normal precipitation has fallen here this year. Further west you go, the worse it gets. Southwestern Manitoba and southeastern Saskatchewan, both considered to be under extreme drought conditions right now. One place you really see it is in the rivers. In spring, flooding is usually the worry along the Seuss River near Brandon. That's it today. Those rocks are normally at least a meter underwater. This is a real telling fact. Bill Campbell is president of Manitoba's main farm group. He says drought is already impacting grains and livestock. You kind of hate to use the word drought, but I I think we need to call it what it is at this point in time. We need uh, days of rain, uh, multiple day uh, rain events. Climate researcher John Pomeroy says it's part of a broader North American drought. Hits to the Canadian economy so, uh, could be severe. Impact is like losing the automotive industry out of southern Ontario. It's something on that scale uh, of a severe drought. Some towns are worrying about water reserves. Forest fires are already flaring up in Manitoba. Chuck Fossey is just hoping for the best. Dry is dry, and nothing grows without water. That's just a fact of life. For now, those dusty fields aren't looking promising. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, near Starbuck, Manitoba. Let's bring in meteorologist Johanna Wegg's staff. Joe, I know you've been watching the science mm-hmm. behind the drought. Yeah, that's right. It's as we as we've heard, uh, it's deep it, underground and it's been going on for a while now. This is the second season of back to back dry winters and springs. I want to take you to uh, the latest uh, conditions from uh, the Canada Drought Monitor. This was this is a snapshot April 30th. It has only got drier in the past couple of weeks. Extreme drought in red, uh, and that actually extends south of the border. Uh, 85% of North Dakota also under an extreme drought. There's only one level higher, which is exceptional drought, uh, which we do rarely see. But again, as we head into what is a dry forecast, there are concerns. And it, it's hard to measure soil content. There are many different ways, uh, soil moisture content, I should say, but it does look like this may be one of the driest maize uh, for soil moisture ever on record. And again, that's really the back-to-back, not only dry springs, but the low snow packs we had uh, through the winter. And we see more and more of these blocking patterns that are leading to sort of rain on either end of high pressure that parks itself over the prairies. But as I take you through the forecast for the prairies, Just some light showers, uh, perhaps for parts of Saskatchewan. I mean, we'll take it, uh, but not much in through southern Saskatchewan and southern Manitoba. And as we uh, heard from uh, Cameron McIntosh, we need days, if not uh, a couple months of above seasonal precip. Winnipeg, I was looking at the uh, precip, uh, just 0.7 millimeters so far this May. Averages are closer to 60 millimeters. So definitely a story we're watching. Uh, We had some moderate drought conditions for a time there back in uh, mid-April across parts of the island. We're watching for this dry stretch that we're in right now. Just a couple more days of dry weather across the province, but you can see here the fire danger map, moderate to high for most of BC. It doesn't take much, as we keep saying, for things to turn around when we're under that high pressure ridge, but there is an end in sight with this one. Uh, 26 through Kelowna tomorrow, I think not out of the question. As we head into Sunday, we could hit the 30 degree mark for the first time this season across parts of the uh, southern Okanagan. Cranbrook at a 24 for tomorrow. 
a few more clouds in Prince George's mix, but I think in the afternoon you'll see the sunshine and Prince Rupert, you're getting the rain. That's where the bulk of it has been directed. But watch as they take you through the weekend. So high pressure holding strong across the south, but you can see that plume of moisture starts to sink south. By Sunday, not out of the question, we see some showers in through Port Hardy and that is what, what is headed our way for Monday. But we do get a nice weekend under that ridge of high pressure. You can see here uh, through to Sunday, those warmer yellows and greens begin to sink south and we get back to more seasonal temperatures as well by the time we hit early next week. So breaking it down, 18 for tomorrow, 19 for Sunday. That's why we are inland. We're talking 23s to 24s. We may break a few records. I was looking at some of the records to beat and uh, we'll probably end up a degree or two below any records. A 17 for Monday. So again, back down to where seasonals are 30 or average afternoon highs are around 16. It's a mixed bag next week. I don't see a huge rainmaker, but uh, just the kind of weather that uh, gardeners and, well, basically everyone will enjoy, I think. Something for everyone. Indeed. And uh, for those who like weekends, this pattern is uh, entirely acceptable. It's Mike approved. There you go. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, when is a board game not really a board game? When it becomes life-size, of course. The inspiration behind this, Snakes and Ladders, next. The celebration, the self-acceptance, the sheer joy of inclusion. All of that on full display at Toronto's Pride Parades. But for many in the Asian community, participating in public celebrations like this often come later in life. Growing up as like an Asian person, we are taught like to concentrate on school, on our career first. Uh, so I think that comes into play and then so then we're, you know, we're told not to date. And often as a queer person, as an LGBTQ person, we, do, we don't get to experience dating or being able to pursue our crushes at a young, we tend to do that at a later age. Ryan Tran draws from his own life experience. Born in Canada to Vietnamese parents, culture and language were major barriers to expressing his feelings. And so I didn't grow up learning the language of Vietnamese. And so there's not always a direct translation or we're not gonna grow up knowing what gay, how to say gay in the, in the Vietnamese language. And so that can be really hard to, to tell our parents. Going through this journey now informs Ryan in his professional life. He's the manager of education and outreach with Asian Community Aid Services or ACAS. Their program, called When You're Ready, uses a culturally sensitive lens to help youth navigate being both LGBTQ and Asian. Sexual health, harm reduction, mindfulness, mental health, choice and family, um, and they all, it's, it's all related to coming out. Often they are in the place where they feel alone, like how I felt. Um, feeling like the only queer Asian person. So to be part of this program is like, it is almost like finding community or another family. It was a historic day for the gay, Asian, LGBT, Asian community. Pink Dot Toronto is another program that ACAS helped establish. Originating in Singapore in 2009, the Pink Dot event is a way to show support for the LGBTQ community there. It has since spread to cities worldwide. The first Pink Dot TO event was held in 2015 with a march and celebration in Chinatown. This year, it'll be virtual. lost a lot of spaces, not a lot of places where we can't get together as queer people, as in a safe space. And so having this kind of event online, again, increases that representation, that visibility that we still exist, that we're still here, and that we're, we're still here as your community.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. May is Asian Heritage Month, and we are celebrating by sharing the stories of amazing Asian Canadians who are making meaningful contributions in the community. Visit cbc.ca slash bccommunity to learn more. And CBC Vancouver is proud to return as media sponsor of the 2021 DOXA Documentary Film Festival. Get your tickets at doxafestival.ca. Well, the demand for puppies has soared during the pandemic. Long wait lists to adopt through rescue groups here in Canada and some people looking south of the border. As Preston Mulligan reports, rescue organizations from the U.S. have no trouble traveling to Nova Scotia with truckloads of pooches for adoption. Hey, we are officially loaded up, Scout. This video was shot one week ago in Beaumont, Texas. Janine Christian loaded this van with 33 dogs, all of them vaccinated, microchipped, and spayed or neutered, about to hit the road for the 34-hour drive to the main New Brunswick border. And there's Reggie and Rick. <laughs> I wish it was just a wave on through. <laughs> um, Getting across the border was actually fairly easy. Anyone moving animals commercially into Canada from the U.S. is exempt from any restrictions. But the Canadian Food Inspection Agency does require proof that each dog is healthy and vaccinated. But we had all of our paperwork from the federal border where we crossed, um, where we were approved there. We had the registration from Nova Scotia where we went our, online where we were approved to clear there as well. Crossing the border into Amherst with 33 dogs? No problem. Even the adopters who drove from the South Shore, New Glasgow and Cape Breton were permitted to meet the van in Amherst to pick up their new puppy. Local volunteers here in Nova Scotia say they consulted with Minister of Municipal Affairs Brendan McGuire. They say he assured them no one would be fined provided no one but the puppies got out of the car. Tell me about that little puppy. Uh, how old is he? What, what breed? Let's get a look at him. Well, he is a Shih Tzu Chihuini, or Shih Tzu Chihuini, whichever way people want to say it. Joshua Michelin drove from his home near Truro to Amherst Saturday morning to pick up his puppy. To those wondering why adopters like him can leave their community and others can't, he offers this. I believe the, the main difference between visiting people and what we did was it was literally going through a drive through It was literally like you go to pick up food. There was no human contact. There was no visiting. Janine Christian says since she's been moving dogs north from Texas, no infections have been traced back to her group or the adopters. Preston Mulligan, CBC News, Halifax. Bunch of cuties. Yeah, adorable. Nice to see they're going to end up somewhere. Okay, here's an idea to up your outdoor activity game from an artist in Edmonton. Making few people feel happy and empowering people to feel like they're, uh, they can do these types of things. Um, that's, that's what's most important. We can all do this. We just have to get out and do it, right? Um, and uh, do it together. She's behind this creation in the parking lot uh, in an Edmonton neighborhood. Local residents joined to help make this giant snakes and ladders board it fills about 36 wow. square meters the creation is made out of chalk paint and is expected to last for the summer players are encouraged to bring their own dice small or supersized brilliant there's a good idea i get into that why not good activity I always like snakes and ladders classic what was the other one of that time bat uh, battleship was that, were they from the same time? I think so. Oh, but I loved that. I played a lot of Battleship, okay. actually. <laughs> I quite go. enjoyed it. <laughs> let's go with that. <laughs> you can always watch our newscasts anytime online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news right here at 11 with Dan Burrett. That's after the National with Ian Hanneman Singh. Have a good night. Have a great weekend.